Yeah, that's an accurate response. Welcome to Things You Missed. We sure wish we missed this one. Jimmy, how did this all come together? The first title they came up with was Halloween The Homecoming, but the producers switched it because after Halloween H2O's ending, they were nervous people would only show up if they knew for a fact Michael Myers was back to life. The director of Halloween 2 was brought back for this one, but he was actually the third choice after Whitney Rancic, who I personally, unfortunately, have never heard of. Sorry if they're like a huge director or something like that and Dwight H. Little, the director of Halloween 4, who I really would have liked to see come back. I think he deserved a second shot at Halloween, but neither of them wanted to, so they went with Rick Rosenthal. Ah yes, our old friend Rick. Not Rick Moranis, not Rick Ocasek, hell, not even Rick Astley. Rick Rosenthal, the director of Halloween 2 from 1981. Rick was put in a pretty tough spot, to be fair. Redconning the end of H2O by saying that Michael Myers wasn't the one who got killed was never gonna be popular, and killing off Laurie Strode in the first 10 minutes is maybe even a bigger slap in the audience's face. But remember, while old Rick might be the one who delivered that slap, his hand was guided by Malik Akkad. So given the hand he was dealt, did he do an okay job? Not even remotely. Let's get into the things you missed. Before I puke! Sponsored by Ridge Wallet, the slim, modern wallet that holds up to 12 cards, plus cash in over 30 colors, including carbon fiber and burnt titanium. It's durable and comes with a lifetime warranty. Plus, every dollar you spend on Ridge Wallet before September 30th enters you to win a brand new upgraded Ford Bronco. Check out the link in the description and use code CZ's World for 10% off. The film begins with Laurie Strode locked away in a sanitarium after going crazy after killing a paramedic whom she believed to be Michael Myers. As much as we're gonna crap on this movie... And believe us, we are going to crap on this movie. You have to give it a tiny bit of credit for introducing some ideas that were used years later in Halloween 2018 and Halloween Kills in a much better way. Both Resurrection and 2018 use the idea of Lori being the crazy one now, and in Resurrection, they take it even farther by putting her in the sanitarium instead of Michael. The established roles are reversed. She's even gone mute in this one. She hasn't said a word in years. Extreme dissociative disorder. No, she doesn't stare out that window. Coincidentally, staring out the window is just what Michael does in the Myers house in Halloween Kills. Lori is just like Mike. Not to be confused with Like Mike, which also came out in 2002 and from what I remember was a much better movie. The intro also features Lori setting a trap for Michael, something that's used later in Halloween 2018. And this very specific scenario of someone getting injured on the staircase in the Myers house with Michael about to strike before getting distracted and drawn away by another potential victim. This exact circumstance is seen again later in Halloween Kills. There's even a line early on likening Michael Myers to a great white shark. He's the great white shark of our unconscious. I'll talk about this more in depth in a future horror history, but the filmmakers actually used Jaws as a template for Michael Myers in the 40 year trilogy. And it ended up being this very strange mannequin like, you know, soulless, almost great white shark of a human. Love that guy. Oh, and don't forget that Lori is the one dropped from the rooftop during the intro sequence, just like she was in Halloween 2018, which is a reversal of what happens in the original Halloween where Michael is the one who falls and feels the relentless pull of gravity. We first meet Lori in her cell at the sanitarium and she's got this rag doll, similar to the doll seen in her room way back in 1978. Later on, the same doll is seen on the desk of our protagonist, Sarah Moyer. Perhaps this was old Rick's way of telling us that Sarah is the new protagonist now. The interesting thing I learned back in 2018 when I reviewed this movie is that the lead actress, Bianca Kalich, actually can't scream. So every time you hear her scream in this movie, it's dubbed, and that gets even weirder when you consider that the whole reason she's in the Myers house in the first place is because she's supposedly the ultimate scream queen. It's kind of weird, but ultimately it's like the least of this movie's problems. The perfect introduction to the level of care put into this movie can be observed in these two nurses, Phillips and Wells. That's W-E-L-L-E-S, even though it's spelled differently in the end credits. To be fair, Halloween 1 and 2 also had errors in the end credits, stating that Michael Myers was 23 years old rather than 21. Another patient at the sanitarium is named Harold, who is more true crime obsessed than my mom. We first see him hiding behind this tree as the security guard patrols the grounds, maybe the only intentionally creepy moment that the movie has to offer. He's wearing a clown costume, which brings memories of the original Halloween opening where Michael Myers sported a clown seat of his own, but he's actually dressed as John Wayne Gacy, a fellow Illinois-born serial criminal who performed as a clown for children's events. He means fellow to Michael Myers, not fellow to himself, right Zach? 
No comment. Like Michael, most of Gacy's victims were teenagers, ranging in age from 14 to 21. Being Old Rick's first foray into the Halloween franchise in 21 years, Resurrection has a lot of callbacks to Halloween 2, whether it be the shot of the night guard locating Michael on the security monitors, the opening taking place in a hospital, or even this scene where a character slips and falls in a puddle of red arterial fluid. We saw the medic, Jimmy, do just that back in the second movie. Literally every time you say that, I look over. You'd think I'd be used to that by now. Yeah, this is your eighth time being on this channel, which means this is going to be the sixth time that we talk about Halloween's white sheet motif, because it's not in Halloween 3 or 4. Michael appearing behind bed sheets sort of became a meme after the first movie, and plenty of the sequels took note. In Halloween Resurrection, the security guard Willie investigates the laundry room where we see a basket of bed sheets, and then a minute later, he discovers his partner's blood in the laundry machine. Which is similar to Halloween 6, where John Strode, the most hateable character in the franchise, goes into the basement of his house and finds the aftermath of his wife's encounter with Michael Myers. Uh, I did not mean for that to sound as dirty as it did. We first meet our main character, Sarah Moyer, in the middle of one of her college classes. Yeah, Haddonfield University is back after its first appearance in Halloween The Curse of Michael Myers. And the professor is a cameo from none other than old Rick himself. His character's name is Dr. Mixter. Dr. Mixter's class? I'm taking that course too. Which was the name of the head physician at the hospital back in Rick's Halloween 2. Can we call it that? I mean, people call the 2009 entry Rob Zombie's Halloween 2, so I don't really see a problem with it. He's also giving a lesson on the collective unconscious, which is the main theme explored in Halloween 2, where Laurie's relationship to Michael is buried deep within her unconscious mind. If you want to know more about that, we actually talked a lot about it in the Halloween 2 things you missed. Our Rick's Halloween 2 things you missed. Exactly. After class, Jen and her friends scooter through campus where you can see a poster for a Halloween dance. This is probably a different dance than the one Laurie and Annie made plans for in the original Halloween, because that was for a high school dance and these posters are on a college campus, but it still brings back memories of the original and eventually Halloween 2018. Halloween Resurrection is all about this reality show called Dangertainment, which planned to send six college students to investigate the Myers house on Halloween night. With the contestants selected, the fun, or lack thereof, would soon begin, and as always, it would contain a few things you missed. The producer of Dangertainment is this guy, Freddy, whose interests include saying profanity and watching old kung fu movies. The latter is a foreshadowing for his character, who would use martial arts to attack Michael Myers. Uh. To get ready for the Dangertainment shoot, Sarah and Jen shop for clothes in a boutique next to a grocery store which proudly displays a Dracula 2000 poster. I've never seen a supermarket promoting a horror movie before, so it's obvious that this is here because Resurrection is made by Dimension Films, who also made Dracula 2000. We saw Dimension trying to promote their other properties in the last two Halloween movies, The Curse of Michael Myers and H2O. Dimension is also owned by Miramax, who released the 1994 classic Pulp Fiction, which could explain why college students Miles and Scott dress up as characters from Pulp Fiction for a costume party. I I can't think of any other significant reason for this reference, can you? No, that makes sense, because Pulp Fiction is awesome. And also, I just remembered Superbad follows the same structure as Pulp Fiction, and I think that's what makes it the best comedy of all time. Also, when Sarah is browsing costumes with her classmates, she briefly sees Michael Myers in a reflection, but turns immediately to find some random kid. This moment is never explained. The only thing I can figure is that Sarah had expressed thoughts about dropping out of the show due to being too freaked out to sleep. Maybe she started having hallucinations of Michael Myers as well? Whatever the case may be, the scene is a big callback to Halloween 4, The Return of Michael Myers, where Jamie Lloyd similarly sees the boogeyman in a mirror while browsing costumes and freaks out. <laughs> Michael's boutique store visit isn't the only appearance of his that goes completely unexplained in the movie. When Dangertainment contestant Bill sneaks up on Jen to scare her, the camera glitches out for no apparent reason, during which we see one frame of Michael Myers. None of them have encountered Michael yet at this point, so it's not like this is supposed to be a Cloverfield-like effect where we're seeing previously recorded footage. You could say that this was more of a malignant type of thing, where Michael found a way to telepathically communicate through audio and video devices, but again, that's not something that ever happens in this movie. This same kind of thing happens again at the end of the movie, but this time on the news cameras, which makes even less sense, because they weren't even there for anything that happened in the house. The sad thing is, I actually really like the idea of a found footage Halloween movie. The franchise is so stale, and I think approaching Michael Myers through found footage could be a great way to make him scary and mysterious again. But this ain't it, Rick. This ain't it. Friday the 13th almost came back as a found footage movie after the 2009 reboot, but for a variety of reasons, that version of the movie never got off the ground, and still, all these years later, I really would like to see it. As Freddy's assistant Nora gets ready 
ready for the show, she gets up to grab coffee while dancing to a song she knows. The camera tilt down to her ass and then back up so we can see what she's actually doing is one of the most blatantly forced eye candy moments I've ever seen. They easily could have just used a different lens to get some booty in frame, but no. Our boy Rick was down bad on this one. Nora also calls a tow truck to remove a car parked in front of the house. Given the level of care put into this movie, I'm sure the fact that the license plate says 6395 bears no real significance, but as someone who is always on the lookout for Easter eggs and secrets, my initial thought was that these were the years that the initial Halloween timeline took place. It started when Michael was a kid in 1963 and ended when Michael confronted Loomis for the final time in 1995. 63 and 95. Coincidence? I think- yes! Besides, none of the other license plates in the film seem to reference anything notable. The characters split off into three groups, and of course, we follow the two characters who weren't even in the movie before this point, save for one quick soundbite, so why would we care what happens to them? There's definitely some flirtation going on between them, but the girl, Donna, has a comeback that cuts even deeper than Michael Myers' knife. Besides, screwing a music major would be tantamount to lesbianism. I'm pretty sure John Carpenter, the director of the original Halloween, was a music major at Western Kentucky University before transferring to USC to study film. So that line is either a really funny jab or a painfully awkward mistake. I don't know the exact relationship between Rosenthal and Carpenter, but based on what Carpenter has said about Halloween 2 over the years, I would guess this line is intentional. Speaking of Halloween 1, Sarah finds herself in a situation that's very comparable to what happens to Lori Strode. She investigates a shuttered closet and gets scared by a dummy that falls on it. Her friend Rudy, instead of simply opening the closet, just punches his hand straight through it, which is obviously reminiscent of what Michael does when Lori is the one trapped in the closet at the end of Halloween 1. This is what we call a dumb easter egg. Not only does it not add anything to the movie, but everyone who just saw it is dumber after witnessing it. Down in the basement, Donna is scared by a rat, which is something that happens in the only other movie in this franchise where the Myers house is shown to have a basement. Halloween 5, The Revenge of Michael Myers. Basically, if you see a Myers house with a basement, you can assume you're in for a bad time. Donna later discovers that Michael has been surviving in the basement by eating rats, and that's a callback to the original movie when Brackett and Loomis discover the half-eaten dog in the Myers house. It is also in this basement where she stumbles upon this article about Laurie Stroud. I guess this is is supposed to tell us that Michael has been keeping tabs on her all this time, which we already knew from H2O, and we don't really need to know because Lori's already dead. Donna reads out the supposed headline. Lori Strode, sister of Michael Myers, survives Halloween Night Massacre. Which doesn't match what the text actually says. Lori Strode has been nominated by the Chamber of Commerce as the most commonly something teen. I can't make out what that word is. I spent like 10 minutes trying to figure it out and was not willing to waste any more of my life with a minute detail from the worst Halloween movie. Zach and I took a super close look and we both think it says spirited, but the most commonly spirited teen doesn't really make sense. So I don't really know or care. It's just weird and we wanted to point it out. The picture chosen for the article is interesting though. It's actually this behind the scenes photo taken during the production of the original Halloween during the scene where Lori waits for a pickup from Annie right outside her house. If anyone wants to make their own version of this photo, you can still go to the location and they even leave a pumpkin out to use as a prop. Donna nearly hooks up with her fellow contestant, Jim. Yes, another Jim in the Halloween universe. It's getting old at this point. Which by the way is really stupid because the whole reason they're there is to be filmed and they know they're on camera. So why wouldn't you just wait till after the show to hook up. After this, Donna gets dressed and explores the basement more, which is when she has her encounter with Michael Myers. He kills her by impaling her on this crooked beam that's sticking out of the gate, during which she is somehow magically wearing a bra again, which is weird because earlier we saw her put her shirt back on and she's very clearly not wearing a bra. I just can't believe Rick would let this slide. Once the bloodshed begins, it doesn't stop. But if we take a closer look at some of these kills, we can find a few more anomalies. Another Halloween franchise trope that happens in this movie is the one where someone is mistaken for Michael Myers and pays the price for it. The first time we saw this was with Ben Tramer in Rick's Halloween 2, RIP, then Ted Hollister in Halloween 4, then Spitz in Halloween 5. In Halloween Resurrection, it's the producer Freddy. We can actually see the Michael Myers mask on his desk before he goes into the house with it and gets attacked by Jim. Unlike Ben, Ted, and Spitz, Freddy survives. Sarah's friend Jen is not so lucky. She gets decapitated by the real Michael Myers, not you, after which we can see the inside of the mannequin's neck. They didn't add any visual effects here to make it look real. I normally don't mind cheesy effects in a low-budget horror movie, but the problem here is that one of the plot points of this movie is literally that the house is filled with mannequins and Halloween decorations staged by the Dangertainment production team, so it's unclear if we're supposed to believe that Jen's death is staged or real, which is exactly how the internet viewers at the Halloween party react. Miles thinks it's real and calls the police and gets connected immediately because the makers of this movie have no idea how a phone call works. Yeah. 
Hello, 911. This has been real 911 calls that actually happened. Rudy is the next character to confront Michael. I know his whole character is him being a chef and all he thinks about is nutrition, but I love how that's still the only thing he talks about as he's facing certain death. You should try a little less protein in your diet, you know? Control some of that aggression, huh? I don't even know if that's a thing. The only reputable study I've been able to find linking protein and aggression was studying dogs. Do you think dogs are a good source of protein? I don't want to find out, but according to this movie, rats are a perfectly fine source of protein. Rudy gets to be the victim of the knife pin kill, also known as the Bob Sims kill, the Kelly Meeker kill, the Nurse Mary kill, the Dave kill, whatever you want to call it. Sarah ends up being the only remaining contestant, so Miles, also known as Deckard, sends her text messages to alert her of Michael's position in the house. Like this one, where he informs her that Michael is in the hallway and says don't scream to which she immediately screams <laughs> what a dumbass she's even worse than nina from saw 7. why would you just shut the Sarah climbs out through the window onto the roof to escape, which might be a callback to Rachel and Jamie in Halloween 4. I'm gonna believe it is because I love Halloween 4. I also find it really funny that Michael opens the window by headbutting it. I guess people in this movie just really like to break things instead of opening them. As we already mentioned, Sarah is just not the brightest. I don't know how she even got accepted into Haddonfield University because instead of going to the lowest point of the roof and jumping, she goes back into the house to escape. You know, the house where the serial killer is. I mean, the roof isn't even that high. It's certainly certainly seems safer to jump rather than climbing over the body hanging from the attic stairs. For a moment there, it looks like she's about to Spider-Man kiss the corpse, which is funny if you consider that Spider-Man was still in theaters when Resurrection came out in July of 2002. Freddy comes back to the house to save Sarah and drops this line on Michael. So you want to be on Dangertainment? Not only is that a terrible line, but Michael's reaction is certainly meme-worthy. You're in his house. Imagine if I broke into someone's house to ask them if they wanted to be on Things You Missed. In true Rick Rosenthal Halloween movie fashion, it ends with Michael being lit on fire. Things get a little bit dicey for Sarah when she gets pinned down by a mixing board? Are you fucking serious? Anyway, Freddy saves her by electrocuting Michael Myers in the penis, which sends him flying across the room, apparently. It's good to know that Michael's one weakness is being electrocuted in the penis. There are actually four endings to this movie. One where Michael comes back to life on the gurney and is immediately killed by an axe that Sarah somehow has. One where she meets Deckard slash Miles in real life and he says, Well, you did it. You killed the boogeyman. Which is a callback to Tommy Doyle's line in the original movie. You can't kill the boogeyman. And one where crime scene investigators are let in by this cop who is played by Brad Laurie, the actor under the Michael Myers mask throughout the movie. That one ends with Michael reaching out of the wreckage to grab the investigator as a one last scare moment. Supposedly Rick wanted to send different versions of the film out to different theaters so that the ending you got could have been any one of these four. This tactic was used for the 1985 film Clue. I actually think it's a cool idea, but the studio rejected it, probably realizing that it was a tactic that would only build hype if the movie was actually good. So the ending scene of the movie shows Michael coming back to life in the morgue, which obviously finally gives meaning to the title of Halloween Resurrection. I think that's why they called it that anyway, because there's no other resurrection that happens in this movie. This movie also went through several different titles before it came out. We already mentioned Halloween Homecoming, but there was also Halloween H2K, which I guess is a riff on Y2K, which is kind of weird because it happened a few years before before this movie came out, and also HalloweenMichaelMyers.com. Yes, HalloweenMichaelMyers.com. Wow, that is one of the worst titles I've ever heard. Ultimately, I find it pretty funny that they decided on Halloween Resurrection now. There's something so ironic about Resurrection being the one to kill your franchise. Halloween Resurrection was so bad that they decided to end the 20 year timeline and start fresh five years later with Rob Zombie's remake of Halloween. However, we're gonna skip ahead and talk about the 40 year timeline next. So get ready if you wanna hear everything you might've missed in Halloween 2018, Halloween Kills and Halloween Ends. Look out for those new episodes in the playlist on the left. Thanks to Jimmy Champagne for joining me once again. And remember to subscribe to CZ's World for new horrors every week. Ring the death bell and select all notifications. And I will see you in the next one. Assuming we both survive. Oh, we made it. We made it.